Did you know that salt has incredible spiritual power in the Bible? Let's uncover the hidden truths about salt as a weapon in spiritual warfare. But before we get to that, make sure that you take a second to subscribe so we can bring the message of God to the entire world. Now let's get back to it. First things first, we need to acknowledge an absolute truth. Everything in this world was created by God, through Him and for Him. Nothing exists out of His will. And that includes salt. Yes, that little white crystal you use to season your food has a divine purpose. Think about it. God created salt even before life itself. In the book of Genesis, we read that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Salt, being a mineral, was part of that initial creation. It's been around since day one, folks. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. The church often avoids discussing this because God grants authority not just to humans, but also to plants, animals, and the elements. Each thing in creation has a divine purpose. Consider fire and water, for example. Fire has the authority to consume everything it touches, while water has the authority to give life. Similarly, salt was given the authority to season and preserve. But it doesn't stop there. Salt, like oil, bread and wine, plays a sacred role in the Christian faith. Some people might think salt is an evil thing used in dark rituals, but that's a lie from the enemy. Remember what Jesus said in John 10? The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. The enemy wants to steal the truth about salt from us. So what is this truth? Well, salt is actually a powerful spiritual weapon that God has given us. It's not just for making our food taste better. It has the power to break curses and bring blessings of abundance upon us. Sounds pretty awesome, right? But before we go deeper into the spiritual significance of salt, let's take a moment to appreciate its importance in the physical world. Throughout history, salt has been incredibly valuable. In ancient times, it was even used as currency. Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt, which is where we get the word salary. Salt was essential for preserving food, making it a crucial commodity. This physical importance of salt helps us understand why God would use it as a spiritual symbol. Just as salt preserves food and makes it last longer, the spiritual use of salt can help preserve our faith and make it endure through trials and challenges. Now let's take a closer look at how salt is used in the Bible. Believe it or not, salt is mentioned quite a few times in both the Old and New Testaments. And it's not just in passing. Salt plays some pretty significant roles in biblical stories and teachings. One of the most famous mentions of salt in the Bible is when Jesus calls his disciples the salt of the earth in Matthew 5. But what does that actually mean? Well, we'll get into that later in this video, so stick around. In the Old Testament, we see salt being used in some pretty powerful ways. For example, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt when she disobeys God's command and looks back at the city. Here, salt is used as a form of punishment for disobedience. But salt isn't just used for punishment in the Bible. In Leviticus 2, God commands the Israelites to season all their grain offerings with salt. He says, do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. This shows us that salt was seen as a purifying agent capable of cleansing impurities. In 2 Chronicles, we read about something called a covenant of salt. It says, Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? This introduces us to another important quality of salt in the spiritual realm, its ability to establish and seal covenants. So, we've seen that salt in the Bible has at least three main attributes in the spiritual realm, to purify, to covenant, and to curse. Pretty powerful stuff for something we usually just sprinkle on our food, right? But there's more. In the New Testament, Jesus uses salt as a metaphor for how his followers should live. In Mark chapter 9, verse 50, he says, Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Here, salt represents the distinctive, flavorful lives that Christians should lead, lives that stand out and make a difference in the world. Now, here's where things get really interesting. 
What do you think witches and sorcerers use salt in their rituals for? It's not because salt is inherently evil. No, they use salt precisely because they are aware of its spiritual attributes. They know it's a mineral created by God that transcends both the material and physical worlds. The enemy has tried to make Christians and the entire world believe that salt is an instrument of evil, used only by sorcerers. But today you're going to understand that salt isn't just some rusty tool used in the Old Testament and forgotten. The covenant of salt is everlasting, and if Christians have stopped using it, it's because they've been cunningly deceived. Think about it. In the Bible we see God and his prophets using salt for powerful purposes. But somewhere along the line, we've forgotten about this incredible spiritual tool. We've let the enemy steal this truth from us. But here's the good news. If you're a genuine child of God, you don't need to fear the sorcerer who uses salt against your home, work or business. You have the authority to undo any witchcraft and revoke curses. Salt is our inheritance and it's time we reclaim it. The enemy's strategy is always to take what God created for good and twist it for evil purposes. We see this pattern throughout the Bible and throughout history. The enemy takes God's good gifts and tries to corrupt them, hoping to turn us away from the truth. But we shouldn't let fear of the enemy's tactics keep us from using the tools that God's given us. Just because sorcerers misuse salt doesn't mean that we should abandon it. Instead, we need to reclaim it for its proper, God-given purpose. Remember, the power doesn't come from the salt itself, but from our faith in God and our obedience in His Word. When we use salt in spiritual warfare, we're not putting our faith in the salt, but in the God who created it and gave it its spiritual significance. Now here's a question that might blow your mind. Did you know that salt is the only element in the Bible used both to bless and to curse? It's a weapon of God, inherited by His children. But the enemy tries to use it against us. Don't be afraid though. Remember what Jesus said? You are the salt of the earth. We have the authority to use salt for both war and peace. Think of it like an army. It's made for the protection of a country and will be used when an invader tries to take the territory by force. As long as there's no invasion, the army remains passive, but always prepared. Unfortunately, in spiritual warfare, the enemy is already attacking Christian territory. That's why we need to be ready to use salt to curse the enemy's army. Now, I know cursing sounds harsh, but remember, we are in a spiritual battle here. Let me give you an example of how salt can be used in spiritual warfare. You can take consecrated salt and spread it in your home, your neighborhood or your city. As you do this, you can pray with authority, asking God to dry up all the works of the evil and enemy, undo all witchcraft and idolatry, and bind every spirit of vengeance that wishes to come against you and yours. But salt isn't just for spiritual warfare. It's also a powerful tool for purification and blessing. Remember the story of Elisha in the Bible? He went to a spring of bad water, threw in some salt and declared, This is what the Lord says. I have healed this water, never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure, to this day. This shows us the power of salt when used in faith and obedience to God. It can purify, heal and bring life where there was once only death and barrenness. It's important to understand that when we use salt in spiritual warfare, we're not engaging in some kind of magic ritual. We're using a physical symbol to express our faith and to remind ourselves of God's power and promises. The salt itself doesn't have any magical properties. It's our faith in God and our obedience to His word that makes the difference. When we use salt to bless, we're declaring God's goodness and asking for His favor. When we use it to curse, we're really just standing against evil and declaring that it has no power over us. In both cases, we're relying on God's power, not on any inherent power in the salt itself. Now let's talk about something really fascinating, the salt covenant. In Numbers 18, God speaks of a covenant of salt forever before the Lord. But what exactly does this mean? In ancient times, salt was incredibly valuable. It was used not just for seasoning food, but also as a preservative. Because of its ability to prevent decay, salt became a symbol of durability, loyalty and performance. When people made covenants or agreements, they would often eat a meal together that included salt. 
This was seen as a guarantee of enduring friendship and a promise of perpetual fidelity. The idea was that once you had shared salt with someone, you were bound to them in loyalty. It was said that if you ate the salt of a man, you became their friend for life. God wanted every sacrifice made to him to be a reminder of his relationship with his people. That's why he commanded that salt be added to every offering. It was a symbol of the enduring nature of his covenant with them. This concept of salt covenant is still honoured in some parts of the world today. There are stories of travellers being protected by thieves because they'd shared a meal with salt, creating an unbreakable bond of hospitality and protection. But here's the thing, the salt covenant isn't just some ancient custom, it's still valid for us as believers. When we understand the power of this covenant, we can use it in our spiritual lives to strengthen our relationship with God and to stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. The Sword Covenant reminds us that our relationship with God is meant to be enduring and unchanging. Just as salt preserves food, God's covenant preserves us. It's a reminder of his faithfulness and his commitment to us. When we partake in communion, we're participating in a kind of salt covenant with God. The bread and wine represent Christ's body and blood given for us. This meal seals our covenant relationship with God through Christ. Understanding the concept of salt covenant can also help us in our relationships with others. It reminds us of the importance of loyalty, faithfulness, and keeping our word. In a world where promises are often broken, we can stand out by being people who honour our commitments, just as God honours his covenant with us. So, how can we practically use salt in our spiritual lives? Well, there are actually several ways that we can employ this powerful spiritual tool. First, we can use salt for purification. Remember how the Israelites used to sprinkle salt on their offerings? We can do something similar. Some churches, when receiving tithes and offerings, sprinkle salt on them and pray for them to be purified from all impurity. Even if your church doesn't practice this, you can do it at home before giving your tithe. We can also use salt to break curses and cleanse spaces. If you believe there's been some kind of spiritual attack on your home, workplace, or even on yourself, you can use consecrated salt as part of your prayers for cleansing and protection. But here's an important point. It's not the salt itself that has power. The power comes from God. The salt is just a physical representation of our faith and obedience. It's a tool that God has given us to use in our spiritual battles. When using salt in spiritual warfare, it's important to handle it with reverence and respect. If you're going to consecrate salt for spiritual use, it's best to buy a whole new package and dedicate it 100% to the service of God. Don't use it for cooking or anything else. It should be used solely to honour God. The same goes for the container you put it in. It's best to buy a new container and dedicate it specifically for this purpose. This might seem like overkill, but remember, we're dealing with powerful spiritual principles here. It's important to approach this with the right attitude of reverence and dedication. When using salt and spiritual warfare, you could start by praying over it, asking God to consecrate it for his purposes. You might say something like, Lord, I dedicate this salt to you. I ask that you use it as a tool for your glory to bring cleansing, protection and blessing. In Jesus' name, Amen. Then, as you sprinkle the salt, you could pray specifically for what you want God to do. For example, if you're using it to cleanse your home, you might pray, Lord, I sprinkle the salt as a symbol of your purifying power. I ask that you cleanse this home from every evil influence and fill it with your peace and presence. In Jesus' name, Amen. Remember, the power is not in the ritual itself, but in your faith in God and His Word. The salt is simply a physical act that helps us express our faith and focus our prayers. Now let's talk about something really interesting, the Valley of Salt. This place is mentioned a few times in the Bible and it's always in the context of great victories. In 2 Samuel, we read that David became famous when he returned from defeating 18,000 Armenians in the Valley of Salt. Later in 2 Kings, we hear about another Israelite king Amaziah, who killed 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. So, what's so special about this place? Well, the Valley of Salt represents a place of battle and victory. 
It's where God's people faced overwhelming odds, but came out victorious because God was with them. But here's the key point. They had to fight the battle. God gave them the victory, but they had to show up and engage in the fight. This is an important lesson for us as believers. Yes, God fights our battles, but we have a part to play too. Many of us have gotten into the habit of just praying and crying out to God, expecting Him to do everything while we sit back. But that's not how it works. Jesus, the Word made flesh, didn't just pray. He acted. He combined faith with action. So when we face our own Valley of Salt moments, those times when we're up against seemingly insurmountable odds, we need to remember to combine our prayers with action. We need to be willing to step out in faith and engage in the battle, trusting that God will give us the victory. The Valley of Salt can also represent those bitter experiences in our lives, the times of hardship, struggle and pain. But just as God turned the Valley of Salt into a place of victory for his people, he can turn our bitter experiences into moments of triumph. Remember, salt in the ancient world was valuable and essential for life. So, even though the Valley of Salt may sound like a barren, lifeless place, it actually represented something precious. In the same way, our times of struggle, our Valley of Salt experiences, can produce something precious in our lives if we trust God and stay faithful. When you're going through your own Valley of Salt, remember the victories that God gave his people in that place. Let it encourage you to keep fighting, keep believing and keep moving forward. Your Valley of Salt could be the place where God gives you your greatest victory. Now let's talk about something really exciting, how salt can be used in miracles. We've already seen how Jesus referred to his followers as the salt of the earth, but did you know he also used elements like salt, mud and saliva in some of his miracles? In John 9, we read about Jesus healing a man who had been blind from birth. Instead of just speaking healing, Jesus did something unusual. He spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Then he told the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. When the man did this, he came back seeing. Now, why did Jesus use mud and saliva? He certainly didn't need to. We know he could heal with just a word. But Jesus often used physical elements as part of his miracles. This shows us that God can use the physical to manifest the spiritual. In the same way, we can use salt as a physical representation of our own faith when we're praying for miracles. It's not that the salt itself has any magical properties, rather, it's a tool that helps us connect the physical realm with the spiritual realm. But here's the crucial part. Just like the blind man had to go wash in the pool, we need to combine our use of salt with obedience and action. It's not enough to just sprinkle salt around and expect miracles to happen. We need to be obedient to what God is telling us to do. Think about the story of Naaman in the Old Testament. He was a powerful commander, but he had leprosy. The prophet Elisha told him to wash seven times in the river Jordan to be healed. At first, Naaman was offended. He thought the prophet would do something more dramatic. But when he humbled himself and obeyed, he was healed. The same principle applies when we use salt in faith. The salt itself doesn't perform the miracle. It's our faith and obedience that opens the door for God to work. So how might this look in practice? Let's say that you're praying for healing. You might take some consecrated salt, sprinkle it as you pray and then take a step of faith. Maybe going to the doctor or doing something you couldn't do before because of your condition. The salt becomes a physical reminder of God's healing power and your action demonstrates your faith. Or perhaps you're praying for a breakthrough in your finances. You might sprinkle salt on your bills as you pray, asking God for provision. Then you take action, maybe looking for a new job or finding ways to cut expenses. The salt represents God's abundance and your actions show that you're partnering with Him. Remember, miracles in the Bible often involved ordinary things used in extraordinary ways. Moses' staff, David's sling, Jesus' mud, all ordinary things that became channels for God's power when used in faith and obedience. Now let's circle back to something we mentioned earlier. Jesus calling his followers the salt of the earth. What did he mean by that? And how does it apply to us today? When Jesus used this metaphor, 
He was speaking to a culture that understood the value of salt. They knew it as a preservative, a flavor enhancer, and even a fertilizer. So when Jesus called his disciples salt, he was saying something profound about their role in the world. First, as salt preserves food, Christians are meant to preserve what is good in society. We're called to stand against corruption and decay, to be a moral and spiritual preservative in a world that often seems to be rotting away. Second, just as salt enhances flavor, Christians should bring out the best in the world around them. We should make life tastier for those around us through our love, joy, and good deeds. Third, salt makes people thirsty. As Christians, our lives should make others thirsty for the living water that only Jesus can provide. Our way of living should make people curious about the source of our peace, joy, and love. But Jesus also gave us a warning. Salt that loses its saltiness is useless. In the same way, if we as Christians lose our distinctive flavor, if we become just like the world around us, we've lost our purpose. So how do we stay salty? By staying connected to the source of our saltiness, Jesus himself. Through prayer, studying God's word and living in obedience with him, we maintain our distinctive Christian character. This understanding of salt as a symbol of discipleship can transform how we see our role in the world. We're not just passive recipients of God's grace, we're active agents of his kingdom, meant to make a tangible difference in the world around us. Now, before we wrap up, I want to give you an important warning. While salt can be a powerful spiritual tool, we need to be careful not to turn it into an idol. Remember the story of the bronze serpent in the Bible? God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole so that anyone bitten by a snake could look at it and live. It was a powerful tool of healing and salvation. But years later, we read in 2 Kings that King Hezekiah had to destroy that same bronze serpent. Why? Because people had started worshipping it, burning incense to it as if it were a god. We need to be careful not to make the same mistake with salt. Salt is a tool, an instrument to be used in service to God. It's not to be revered or worshipped in itself. The power doesn't come from the salt, it comes from God. So use it as a spiritual tool, absolutely. But always remember that it's just that, a tool. Keep your focus on God, not on the salt itself. Also, remember that using salt is not a substitute for living a godly life. We need to be faithful servants still, living in obedience to God's word. Salt won't make up for a lack of faith or disobedience in our lives. It's also important to remember that while salt can be a powerful symbol in our spiritual lives, it's not a requirement for effective prayer or spiritual warfare. God hears our prayers whether we use salt or not. The key is our faith and our heart attitude, not any external ritual. Finally, be wise in how you share these teachings with others. Not everyone will understand or accept the spiritual use of salt, and that's okay. Don't let it become a source of division or argument. Instead, focus on the core truths of the gospel and let your life be the salt that flavors the world around you. The hidden truth of salt in the Bible is powerful. Use it wisely in your spiritual walk. Stay salty, friends and keep shining for Jesus. If you made it all the way to this part in the video, you may qualify for our membership, so you might want to listen closely. It's an exclusive community of people on the spiritual path. It is not for everyone, but only for those that are ready to have their eyes opened. If you want to learn more, hit the link on the left of the screen or check out the link in the pinned comment.